ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to call the uh, uh, July 24th meeting of the uh, Pulmonary County Legislators and the Legislature Public Works Committee to order. And uh, first order of business would be the uh, minutes. Do folks have an opportunity to uh, read the minutes? If so, or any, are there any comments or revisions? If not, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes. Mr. Reinhardt, uh, Ms. Lockhart, all in favor say aye. Yeah, aye. aye. Okay, the minutes are uh, are adopted. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner, Mr. Anzalo. Uh, welcome. Um, I'll read the first two uh, uh, items and perhaps we can discuss them as a group and then we'll take uh, whatever action the committee would like to take, obviously individually. But a re amending resolution number 174 for 2017 regarding design services for the CR9 Brand Hollow Road over Fox Creek Project, and amending resolution number 175 for 2017 regarding the construction of CR9 Brand Hollow Road over Fox Creek Project. Once is, one is the engineer's resolution and the other is the, uh, the contractor's resolution. Yes. From here, I would turn it over to Commissioner Raimondo and uh, uh, Engineer Bill Anslo. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll read a description of, of the process. Um, so upon completion of the asphalt paving portion of the project, Albany County was informed by our hired consultant, construction inspector, on November 13th, 2017, of cracking and settlement of some of the asphalt on County Route 9 between Dutch Settlement and the new concrete approach slab. An investigation was conducted by our hired consultant and Albany County DPW. It was determined that a geotechnical engineer would be required to determine the cause of the settlement. Dente Associates, a geotechnical engineering firm, was retained as a subconsultant to perform soil borings and determine a remedy for the settlement. Five borings, along with instrumentation, were strategically placed along the settlement area to determine the, li the limits and extent of settlement. Some excavation was performed between Dutch settlement and the bridge approach to minimize further settlement. Dente monitored the amount of settlement for approximately four months and designed a plan to remedy the issue. The plan calls for excavating approximately 8 to 10 feet of material from the settlement area and replacing it with a lightweight polystyrene foam block. Subbase base binder and top coarse asphalt will then be placed on top of the polystyrene blocks. A retaining wall will be installed along a portion of County Route 9 and Dutch Settlement to support the roadway and eliminate additional overburden. The engineer's estimate for this work is approximately $1.1 million, including a 10% contingency. Our hired contractor, Betty and Kring, has verified these costs. Um, <coughs> the engineer's estimate is in the backup material. We've spoken with um, New York State DOT and FHWA, and they are in agreement with the remediation plans. The supplemental number one adds $1.1 million to the original agreement for a new total contract amount of $2.178 million. Since this is a federal aid project, the county is responsible for paying 100% of the cost upfront and will then be reimbursed 80% of the total project cost. If there are any questions, um, I open it up to questions. Is, it, is that just on the first resolution, right? Um, this is the first resolution, correct? Well, well let's, this let's is, talk about it. Why don't you go through the, the second one and then sure. we'll talk okay. about them as a, as a whole. Please. Okay. So that, this, that way everybody gets the complete picture of, what, of okay. what's taking place. So this is um, for a supplemental um, agreement with Barton and LeJudas, who is the design engineer um, and the construction inspectors. Um, it's for additional design, construction inspection, and construction support services for the County Route 9 over Fox Creek Bridge project. The legislature authorized the original agreement with Barton and LeJudas in the amount of $218,412 for design services in resolution number 317, dated 9-8-2014. Supplemental agreement number one added $19,000 approximately for additional design work associated with the realignment of Dutch Settlement Road intersection with County Route 9 
as per resolution number 314, dated 8-8-2016. Supplemental agreement number two added 229,000 approximately for additional design, construction inspection, and construction inspection support as per resolution 174, dated 5-8-2017. This additional funding is needed to add design and construction inspection and construction support to remediate the slope failure at the County Route 9 Dutch Settlement intersection as required by the federal, as required by the federal government. We have enclosed documentation <coughs> provided by Barton and Lejudis, DPC, detailing the additional scope of work. This supplemental number three adds 105,000 to the original agreement, including supplemental number one and two, the total contract amount is 466000 for a new total contract amount of approximately 571000 for additional design, construction inspection, and construction support services. Since this is the county is responsible for paying 100% of the costs up front, and it's reimbursed 80% of the project cost. So those are the two supplemental agreements we're requesting for both design, construction, inspection, and construction. Okay. And is that, and, and the, the second one, the Barton Lee Judas bill, that would also be subject to uh, an 80% reimbursement? Yes. Okay, members of, members of the committee? Yeah, does this say we require additional bonding or? No, we have enough bond money for this. How much time is it will this be before winter? I know that's been closed for a year already. Right. We're hoping that if, if all goes to plan, we'll be able to have the bridge open um, and have to wait until next spring to put top course on the approach. But, but yeah, potentially, that's our hope. Chris, this is in your district. Right? Yeah. But that bridge has been closed for how long? Over, so. over. <laughs> yeah. It was like so, two marches ago. That's what it, it was supposed to be open in November. Right. And so it about a year and a half. Okay. Um, any questions from Frank? Barton and Little Judas has no liability here, seeing that they were the original engineering firm and it did not meet. Basically, what, what it ended up having, what we discovered after we hired Dente to do the geotechnical engineering aspect by doing the borings is that as where the footing is, where the uh, approach, it's 31 feet to bedrock. Where we started the settlement, it's 61 feet to bedrock. It's not 75 feet away. There's no, nobody could have ever foreseen that to be that way. Uh, it, it must have been back when the glaciers came through and it, that hogged a, a huge point down through there. And that seems to be what the problem is. And that's what they determined with the borings. Has there, always been a, has there always been a problem with that road? Or this just surfaced? I wouldn't say there always been a problem. There was, over time, we, we've had some, uh, some, a little bit of settlement, but nothing major like this. Nothing where it, it actually, you could watch it go down over time. Mr. Reinhardt? Um, I want to follow up on what Frank asked. I don't quite understand if we hire a design firm to look at a situation and give us specs for construction, why wouldn't they stand behind their work? Why, why wouldn't we be able to say you should have anticipated this? I, I don't understand. I mean, I know there are different layers of dirt about bedrock, but why Why isn't Frank's question legitimate? Why, why isn't there a liability question here about um, the original work? We're spending an awful lot of money now to fix it. I realize a lot of it's federal. You know, so it's not all on our tab, but still, it seems to me like somebody should at least look at this issue of whether or not there's a um, well, what there's a responsibility is, here. Right. Um, there were there were no borings done. Um, that the the RFP for the design work did not include borings. It was thought that bedrock existed um, at a usual level behind the approach to the bridge. There was really um, no reason to expect that there would be 60 feet of clay um, so far back on the approaches. Um, and <coughs> what happened was um, the clay over time, uh, if there's enough extra overburden put on it, can have a slope failure. It's, it's a sheer, sheer failure and it happens. Um, so 
Barton and Lejudis, um, you know, they weren't required to do a boring, um, and I believe it was probably anticipated that the rock that existed right where the abutments are was continuing back behind the bridge. And um, so had borings been done, um, perhaps this could have been um, brought to light earlier. However, if, if it was, the same solution would have to have happened. So most of what we're seeing here in cost is the cost of materials to um, put lightweight fill in this area where the, you know, rock was, you know, where there's like a, a giant um, amount of clay that just couldn't support the extra material on top of it. So is that why you're using geoform here so it's not weight? Correct. So it's you're not weight you're not adding to the shear problem. Correct. And the more we added a little bit extra asphalt at the approach to the bridge to try to bring up Dutch settlement that comes in um, on County Route 9 because it was geometrically not the best um, geometrics to enter onto County Route 9. So when extra material was added, just that much extra caused a shear failure in the clay. And it wasn't anything that you could really anticipate. Um, sometimes in geotechnical engineering, things like this happen. There are sometimes unknowns. So um, that's, that's how I can answer. Well, I can see how, since it wasn't in the RFP that we probably put together, we'd, we'd sort of be in a weak position to blame Barton and Judas for not not doing the core samples. But, you know, I would just suggest we keep our eyes and ears open for new technology that might allow you to, to look down into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, there were some things like this that NYSERDA was working on when I was there. There might be something we can do that would allow us to get a better picture, you know, pre-RFP process. Right. Uh, so we can anticipate perhaps something mm -hmm. that Maybe it's it's a low probability, but obviously it happens. Right. <laughs> Mr. O'Brien, uh, thank you. Um, you said that the, the state's fine with the, the the fix on this. Yes. So they they already looked at all of. So. Okay. Yes. You said that we added asphalt on the approach of the bridge. Uh, no, a uh, Dutch settlement. Oh, to make well, we did right, Dutch settlement. Trailers drag going. Right, away. so we tried to make it so that a car or a truck could come up and be at a reasonable elevation before they pull out, so especially you during winter time. Nine, you added to Dutch settlement. Well, it yeah. added to nine, but we also added a little bit to Dutch settlement to make the, the alignments work, and it was yeah, and get, get it worked it great. That Friday when we left, it was perfect, and then Monday when we showed up, it was not so good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick question. Uh, the 20% mass that we have, is any of that, uh, are we able to use any of our chips or Cape New York or any sort of our funding that we receive in for our match? I do not believe so. Because it's a bridge. It and there's, and I know Bridge New York just came out. We're not able to go retroactively for no. to recoup some of the money no. as well. We have four projects into the Bridge New York where we be here on. Uh, I guess sometime in yeah, in August um, we're supposed August to hear about that. But no, this would not be August. But we could check and see if it's chips eligible. I don't know if it would be, but so certainly. I'm just saying, say said about putting our top four six down. So I know that that would probably be uh, a portion of it would be eligible. And just anything that would cut our long term debt and that we can use the money that we have from uh, sure. chips or um, maybe more green. Uh, Any further comments or concerns from the members? If not, uh, let's go to item one, which is the uh, uh, item one is the Barton and Lejudis uh, amendment, um, amending the resolution number 174 regarding design services for the CR9 Brand Hallow Road over Fox Creek project. Is there a mover? Uh, moved by Mr. Miller, seconded by Mr. O'Brien. Uh, everyone in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The, men, uh, the law is carried. Uh, all right, item number two, which is for the construction contract. 
amending resolution number 175 for 2017 regarding the construction of CR 9 Grand Hollow Road over Fox Creek project. This is for the uh, construction contract. Is there a mover? Moved by Mr. Reinhardt, seconded by Mr. O'Brien. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. All right, Commissioner. Uh, last item, authorizing an agreement with Joe Basil Chevrolet Incorporated regarding the purchase and delivery of four pickup trucks for the Department of Public Works. Hi, um, we're requesting the legislature's approval to enter into a contract with Joe's, Joe Basil Chevrolet for the purchase of four 2019 Chevy Silverado 1500 crew cab pickup trucks. Joe Basil Chevrolet Inc. was the low bidder on the New York State mini bid, um, RFB number 2018-065. The requested purchase is for a total not to exceed $116,000 approximately and is part of our vehicle and truck replacement in the county's capital program. We have attached all supporting documentation and I open it up to questions. Mr. Reiner. Uh, I have a few. Um, I guess I have two channels of question here. The first isn't anything that I think we can affect at the county level. But it would appear to me when I, I went to the OGS website and I looked at the original documents that are referenced in the materials you attached, went back to the procurement documents and everything, it looks like OGS is not requiring any kind of a life cycle cost analysis. All they're doing is they're um, under the mini bid number 1805118, they just say lowest price to single contractor. So, so it's just first price is all they're looking at. I think that's a mistake. I think you should be looking at life cycle cost. Um, what I tried to figure out uh, this afternoon as I was looking at all this stuff is that <clears throat> um, A, they're not requiring in, in terms of the procurement process that anyone takes who joins in or that they go through the process. <coughs> they're not doing life cycle costing, which as I said, I think is a mistake because maybe there's a, 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 a Dodge Ram or an equivalent vehicle that doesn't have as much O&M cost to it, whether it's fuel or maintenance, whatever, repairs. Um, and uh, there's no way to, you know, to, to get to that point through the process that they put out. Now, my, net, my, my second uh, train of thought is, is really more directed to you and, and, and DPW. Can we, on our own, choose to do a life cycle cost analysis and say, okay, we need a, we need a light duty truck, um, we know what the, what the economics are for the Silverado. We know what the economics are for whatever the other vehicles are that would, you know, basically serve the same purpose, but maybe have a different uh, life cycle cost when you factor in O&M along with first price. Mm -hmm. um, so we could do that if we wanted, correct? Yes. And is there, um, is there anything that would prohibit us from doing that and then telling OGS or, or you know going to their procurement process and saying in this case for example well instead of four Silverados we want four Ford 150s or whatever um, you know what um, go ahead. so it's better to maybe explain a little bit more that how our purchasing is handling the, the purchase here purchasing is basically using at their disposal the ability to access state contracts and the pricing with those state contracts. We don't have to take part in that. Like, you know, the, the, the state doesn't make us say, mm -hmm. you're going to buy off of this. If we wanted to, I mean, and collectively as the county wanted to, um, do like a bid in Excel for the same thing and have a function of that within that bid, that is something that we can do without anybody's permission from the state. We can make recommendations to the state. They've asked us for recommendations before. We, you know, conveyed with, to them like uh, our necessities in certain uh, categories of what we need to purchase. Um, it has to give them guidance as to like what specifically we look for into that. We don't have much of uh, input. Say if we wanted to limit or have a life cycle category on their bid. Well, okay. Well, I. I'm not sure I understand because when it looked, it looked to me like we decided what the specs were for the purchase, mm -hmm. and you know that that's an attachment to the the mini bid that they put out. Mm -hmm. Here's you know here's our specs. 
Here's the mini bid with a reference to our specs. So I guess my, what I'm not clear on is if we did life cycle cost to decide what we wanted to spec, in other words, the vehicle, within the category of the vehicle that we know we need, can we do that and then go to them and uh, basically using the same mini bid process that we did use in this case, say, well, we want the Ford instead of the Silverado. Um, so that we would be doing all of the, the lifting, if you will, in terms of figuring life cycle cost analysis. Can, can we do that or, so we don't have to go outside, which sounded like what you were describing, because right. we do it all on our own without, because I think there probably are benefits of, of using the state bidding process. That's why, you know, that's why everybody likes to do it. But um, if we could do the life cycle cost and then basically tell this, tell the state, OGS, this is the vehicle we want to buy four of or, or whatever. Um, if, if that's possible, it seems like that would, might make the most sense as a way to do it. But what I guess, the, the, for me, what I don't know is when I looked at the, the documents on the OGS site where they had all the different subsections of this mini bid, and I saw Silverados, and I saw uh, vans, and I saw you know a bunch of different light duty vehicles. I didn't actually see a, a Dodge Ram and I didn't see a Ford. So I don't know if maybe for a pickup truck, this is the only thing the state procures, right? And so then we'd be stuck. We couldn't use the state process um, and get the economy of scale there if we decided we wanted something other than a Silverado. That's kind of where I'm, right. I'm trying to understand. Right. right, it wouldn't be a level playing field in that regard because the, you know, like whomever is already <coughs> for round numbers, saying they're going to price in that you're going to purchase 100,000 vehicles, or, or mm -hmm. say 50,000 vehicles, to go against someone else. I do, I do understand where you're coming from with that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to call on yeah. myself for a second, because uh, I, I guess one of the questions I have for uh, Commissioner and, and, and Daryl um, aren't you to a certain extent when you set your specs for the truck? taking into condition, uh, not as formally as life cycle, but if you want a V8 engine instead of a six cylinder engine, and you want a three quarter ton pickup instead of a quarter ton pickup, aren't when you setting those specs, you're determining sort of what the common denominators are? Uh, unofficially, for, yes. For you? So I mean, when I, we spec out a truck, uh, we take our past history of, of all the vehicles that we've had over the last 30 or 40 years. We know which pickup trucks seem to last longer for us in our, in our line of work. Then we get quotes on a specific truck. Then we take those quotes and, uh, and then we put those quotes together in a vehicle and send that out to the New York State mini bid. So can we pick Ford Chevy Dodge? No. Can we spec a truck that we would prefer? Yes. So you are, in essence, choosing criteria that you want to maximize your utility yes. and obviously your experience and your ability to self-repair, that Correct. sort of thing. Yes. But you can't tell me, or can you, how much fuel these vehicles use in their duty cycle mm -hmm. with a with, with a de uh, In a total, I can tell you what the, what the vehicles that were replaced them use. Uh, and ironically enough, these four are replacing 2004 Jeep Liberties, which back in the day they were fuel efficient. Uh, these trucks now are 5.3 liter, 355 horsepower trucks, so they have enough horsepower and torque to do the jobs that we're asking them to. Uh, but they also have active fuel management, which puts those down around 16 miles to the gallon and twice the vehicle. Uh, so these vehicles now have enough horsepower to do the jobs we need. They're more fuel efficient than the Jeeps uh, that we're replacing them with. So, and their life expectancy is twice that of our Jeep Liberties and Jeep Cherokees. Mm -hmm. Does not surprise me, because I know technology keeps getting better on engine performance. But um, I guess I would, I, like when I looked at the specs that you've got here on, your, on, the, on the, what you put together, um, you had, for example, uh, E85 flex fuel capable of running on unleaded or up to 85% ethanol. So there is an energy, you know, there is an energy spec that you felt you wanted to include. There, there is certain specs uh, that we can't get away from depending on base packages. Uh, but, but there is also the vehicle marketplace now. So the vehicle marketplace, 
there are certain aftermarket things we can incorporate, uh, such as spray and bed liners. Uh, mm -hmm. ton, or, I'm sorry. Well, that's tap. that's on the, that was on the second page stuff. The, right. Uh, Pinnacle so this mini is, light this bar. Is mini this is a little yeah. bit different than than the marketplace. So this is this is slightly different. Uh, marketplace is more cookie cutter, Makes same sure. identical thing. Uh, nothing aftermarket. These we get to pick the groups, uh, the package groups. Like these trucks have tubular crash bars on the side uh, for snowbank protection, so we're not denting yeah. doors. That's in order to get those. You have to go with the work truck preferred group. Along with that group comes, you know, the digital dashboard and and some other things. When we go, uh, if we don't go out to spec, we don't spec our own trucks. You don't have those op those options, and then those are the things that we end up adding later on. Well, I, I'm not questioning, you know, specking what you need for the work. That's, you know, just make sure I, you're clear on that. I'm not spec. I'm not questioning that. I just feel like we need to be sure that what we're doing is the most economical choice. And first cost is not necessarily the most economical choice, depending on the, you know, the energy performance and the and the maintenance records. It sounds like you're suggesting that you. You've looked at the history of the vehicles that you've had in the past, although in this case it's a totally different vehicle you're swapping out. We, we have several of these now. Uh, started in 2015, we started with, with the Chevrolet mm -hmm. Silverados. Mm -hmm. They, Up to now, they've been very good to us. Uh, and when does the guarantee run out? <laughs> well, that, it's funny you mention that. <laughs> Three years, 35,000 miles, which is more than anything else we can get essentially on a, on a light duty pickup truck yeah. through the state bid because we're in this municipality, because we use them in extreme weather, weather, weather conditions, they kind of get rid of the warranty, much like an ambulance. An ambulance, when you purchase an ambulance, there is no warranty, just like a fire truck. There is yeah. no warranty yeah. other than what that manufacturer gives you. Uh, so these have three or 35,000 miles uh, because of the state bid and because they're Chevrolet. So the Chevrolet actually gives the warranty. Uh, Dodge, as soon as you put a plow on a Dodge, there is no manufacturer warranty. Mm -hmm. Ford. Uh, Ford will give you the warranty on the chassis. However, most of the trucks in, that Ford makes now that gives this kind of horsepower with this kind of fuel mileage are turbo. Uh, but their turbos aren't warrantied for any, anywhere near as long as the gas powered 5.3 liters with the Echo Tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well I think Mr. O'Brien, can we uh, vote mm -hmm. on this or is it? I, I think we can. Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Mr. Ryan Hardy, are you? I, I would like to see some more explicit life cycle costing analysis, but may I, may I make a suggestion that uh, if, if you would like that we uh, we set up a meeting with uh, Karen Storm and with the uh, with the department to talk about the concept of life cycle, how they could work life cycle criteria into a bid, whether it's feasible, legal, or there's a way to show it in such a way that it might be advantageous to the yeah, I would. That would be a good yeah. good policy for the county in general to look at life cycle costing and, and make wider purchases. Are these going to be used in uh, plumbing? They are not. Okay. Uh, they are not. Two of these vehicles are going to uh, our engineering department to replace two uh, Jeep Liberties. Another one is going to our health and safety coordinator to replace a 2001 Jeep Cherokee. And the, the fourth one is going to our electrician uh, also to replace the 2004 Jeep Liberty with just over 200,000 miles on it. Now, did I also hear that we could shop these and not use the state bid, possibly? We, we definitely can. Uh, we definitely can purchase them without using the state bid. However, the state bid, uh, like on these trucks alone, is 36% off manufacturer's suggested retail price. I guess my question is, why would we go out of county to purchase a bid when we could probably go out there and shop it and do just as well, if not better? Uh, we, we've shopped locally, and unfortunately, they cannot beat the state bid, especially when you're buying two, three, or four at a time, because uh, then you get a multi-vehicle discount as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tried to, to purchase vehicles locally, and this would be Region 3. For whatever the reason, the Region 3 trucks cost more. You go out on the state bid, District, our District 19 will bid on trucks in District 3, and then we end up paying a smaller cost to have it shipped here, but even the adding the cost to have it shipped here to the district is still much cheaper than purchasing a truck here. And what about service? I mean, let's say it's a, it's a Chevy in this case. 
Are the local dealers gonna? Absolutely. They are. The, all local dealers, they uh, they completely stand with the with yeah. the warranty. They love the warranty work. It's one of the yeah. few cost centers left sort of in the business <laughs> where, they, where they make money. Well, anyway, uh, did we have a uh, motion, motion to move it. Motion to move it. Seconded by Mr. Smith. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Thank you very much, uh, Thanks, Commissioner and uh, And we have a motion to adjourn. Second? All in favor? Aye. aye. We're adjourned.